Today I'm going to be doing a comparison between the MacBook Pro M1 Pro and the MacBook Pro M1 Max. These two machines are going to go head to head competing against each other in my everyday workflow just to see if I could have saved $1,200 because that's the difference in these computers is $1,200. So with that, let's see if I wasted my money. So the reason these laptops are so important to me, even though I have a Mac Studios literally right there, is because I'm not here six months out the year. I'm out on the road and I need a computer that's gonna perform the same as that one, if not better. Before we continue with the video any further, I wanna let you guys know my good friend Michael Walker did lend me the M1 Pro so I could do this test to do this video for you guys. So uh, leave a comment down below and thank him for letting me use this computer. I know you guys may be making a purchasing decision even though Right now, the, the M2 Pro and M2 Max are out. They're still the used market, which a lot of people buy MacBooks from. In the past, I was using a 2019 MacBook Pro, but every time I was away from the office, I took a massive hit. So when I'm home at the office, the performance is great, nothing to complain about. The computer performs well, but when I'm out on the road, the 2019 computer just sucked, honestly. It did get the job done. I was able to do the work, but it just was not fun at all. It was slow. So I went out and purchased a 2021 MacBook Pro M1 Max. I spec'd it exactly the same as the Mac Studio. The only difference is there's 32 gigabytes of RAM instead of 64. Everything else is exactly the same, including the graphics. I updated the 32 cores for the graphics so it would be exactly the same. I did already make a video on those two comparisons to, to see if I was taking a hit. I definitely recommend you checking it out if you haven't already. I will have it linked down below in the video description. So before we do all the testing, I'm gonna go over the specs real quick of each machine that I will be using today. Starting out with the MacBook Pro M1 Pro. Obviously it has the M1 Pro chip in it, 10 core CPU, 16 core GPU. That is the variant we're using. I know there's a 14 core GPU variant, but we are using the 16 core variant. Also, we are using the 16 gigabytes of RAM, so keep that in mind while we are running these tests today. Let's go over the MacBook Pro M1 Max. It has an M1 Max chip in it, obviously, 10 CPU cores. I upgraded to the 32 core GPU. It has 32 gigabytes of RAM, one terabyte of storage. It has the same exact specs as the Studio, except the RAM on the Studio has 64. The MacBook Pro M1 Max has 32. So a few disclaimers before we get into it. All the footage that was used was shot with the Canon C70, 4K, 60 frames per second, long gob, very challenging format. The project settings were exactly the same. It's actually the exact same project on an SSD. All right, so let's see how long the MacBook Pro M1 Pro takes to proxy all this footage. So as you've seen, this took 25 minutes and 12 seconds to proxy this footage. This was a short YouTube video, so it didn't have much footage to work with. So let's see how that time is gonna compare against the M1 Max. Before that, let's move along to the render and see how long that's gonna take. Okay, so to render this seven minute, 28 second timeline, it took 25 minutes and five seconds. This is a 4K timeline, so keep that in mind. With that, let's go ahead and get into the export and see how long that's gonna take. So exporting this timeline, it took 46 minutes, 14 seconds. We do have to remember, it's a 4K timeline and it's shot in long gob, actually terrible footage to work with. Every computer you would ever throw on it, it sucks. Terrible footage. It looks great, terrible format to work with on a computer though. So keep that in mind. Anyway, that's besides the point. So now let's get into the M1 Max time, starting with the proxies. Let's see how long it takes to see if it shaves off some time. Hopefully I didn't waste my money, but there's only one way to find out. Let's get into the footage and see. All these proxies took 25 minutes and 18 seconds. This is the M1 Max that we're testing, not the M1 Pro, just to clarify. And it's slower right now than the M1 Pro. So the $1,200 so far that I spent is not going into good use. So let's go ahead and get into the render and export, and then I will explain why I think I may have wasted my money. So rendering this timeline took 25 minutes, 47 seconds. Honestly, that is not the result I was hoping for, 
but I do have a theory and I will let you know towards the end of this video what's going on. But let's get into the export and hopefully the results look a little better than what they're looking right now. So the export took 34 minutes, 22 seconds. That's a 12 minute shave off of time from the MacBook Pro M1 Pro. So that's, I'm happy with that, a great result. You're probably thinking to yourself, why so long for a seven minute timeline? And I've been stressing it in the whole video. This is very tough footage to work with. Most of the TV shows that I edit are 1080p, 30 frames per second. This computer can chew right through that, no problem. I've already edited several TV shows with it and it works great, no problems, no complaints. So the reason I think the M1 Pro outperformed the M1 Max on two of the tests out of the three is because the M1 Max draws more power from the wall. It has 36 core GPU, 10 core CPU. The M1 Pro has 10 core CPU, 16 GPU, only 16. The M1 Pro uses less power from the wall than the M1 Max. As you see in this footage, the M1 Max reached 211 degrees Fahrenheit and the M1 Pro only reached 197. The thermal throttle limit for a CPU is 194 degrees Fahrenheit. As you see, the M1 Pro barely reached that, so it was able to hold its sustained load for a longer period of time. The M1 Max was up to 211. It was always in the two, it was in the 200s a lot. Maybe not always, but it was up there a lot. So it had to drop its frequency way more than the M1 Pro. So with saying all that, the M1 Pro was able to hold a higher clock speed. So it was able to actually keep up with the M1 Max. It didn't fully blow it out the water as you've seen in the export. The M1 Max really showed its raw muscle. In the other test, it thermal throttled and barely lost. So that goes to show you how much power the M1 Max actually has because it was thermal throttling and still able to hold its own even though it was thermal throttling a lot. Yes, I wish it would have blew the M1 Pro out the water. So was it worth the money? I think it was worth the money because usually when you're editing, you're not hitting the CPU or GPU 100% of the time. You're scrubbing through the footage, so it racks up the CPU or GPU really quick and then it goes back down. With the Pro, when you drag through the timeline, it's not gonna be as smooth as the M1 Max because the M1 Max dragging through your timeline is not gonna thermal throttle your CPU or GPU because it's not hitting it sustained load for a long period of time. But also, I think if you wanna save the $1,200, you can because the M1 Pro, as you've seen, can hold its own. It don't thermal throttle. It can hold a sustained load and it's actually pretty good in a timeline. It's not as good as the M1 Max, in my opinion, but it still holds its own very well in the timeline scrubbing as long as you render and do all the things you're supposed to do depending on which footage you use if you use sony footage you could scrub through that no problem it depends on which sony footage you're using but you know don't use long gob footage like i did because that footage is rough so with that that's all i have for this video i hope it was informative make sure you hit the like button the subscribe button and i'll see you in the next video